Hello and welcome, I'm Nodira. And today we're going to explore the question that probably many think they know the answer to, but actually very few do. The question is, what is yoga? Of course, it's a vast subject, but here in this video, we're going to try to scratch the surface and hopefully it will ignite your curiosity to explore more. So we'll start with the word. Yoga means union, to bring things together. And yoga is a tradition, an art, and a science that helps us to unite the body, mind, and spirit. And then the next step is the union with the divine, realization of that union, because we've never been separated to begin with. And um, there are four most commonly known paths of yoga, which I will introduce briefly, and then we'll stop at one and go more in detail. So four types for paths of yoga that are most commonly known are karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and jnana yoga. Karma yoga is a yoga of action. Karma is translated as action. But it's not just any action, it's a selfless action. When you provide service to others without any expectations. So you're surrendering the fruits of your actions to the divine. And uh, there are plenty of examples in everyday life when people do something without any kind of expectations. So they are doing karma yoga. The next one is bhakti yoga. Bhakti means devotion. So it is a yoga of devotion. It's most commonly expressed through singing, dancing, or praying. And so when people sing kirtans, let's say, in uh, um, yoga tradition, that is a bhakti yoga. Then we have raja yoga. Raja means royal. And this is one that we're going to explore in more detail. Uh, it's also known as ashtanga yoga. Ashtanga meaning eight limbs. So it's a system that has eight limbs, and each limb has a step that provides um, different ways of moving towards the enlightenment. Finally, there is jnana yoga. Jnana means knowledge, sometimes pronounced gnana. And it is thought as one of the most difficult uh, paths of yoga since one tries to un unite with the divine through the mind. So by studying sacred texts, using the knowledge to understand the nature of the universe. So now we are going to step back to explore Raja Yoga in more detail. Uh, why Raja Yoga? Because uh, one of the limbs is practiced in the West. It's asanas, postures, but it's just one of the limbs of this system. Raja Yoga has been put into system by Patanjali, an ancient sage, um, long time ago, about 2000 years ago, people say, in India. Of course, because um, it's been such a long time, no one knows the details. Some people say it was not just one person, it was a collection of knowledge from many people. Uh, but the end result was the sutras, yoga sutras of Patanjali where the eight limbs of yoga were put into writing and so one can follow the system to achieve enlightenment. The first limb is yamas. So yamas are restraints, things not to do. And before we are going to go any further, uh, I just want to note that unlike in religion, Yoga is not asking you to believe in anything. It's not faith-based. It's very practical, so it just asks you to test things out. And so um, the steps that are laid out in the text are not there to say, if you don't do them, you're going to be punished in any way. Absolutely not. It's just the practical guidance to the best lives we can have. So we'll start the first, yam, uh, the first yama. The first yama is ahimsa. 
and some of you may have heard it because it's been uh, popularized by Mahatma Gandhi, who used this concept heavily in his fight for independence of India. Ahimsa means non-violence. Expressed in positive term, it can be understood as compassion or kindness. And we can practice non-violence, of course, everything starts with yourself, with ourselves, by being kind and compassionate to ourselves, by treating our body kindly, by uh, taking care of ourselves. Um, but then it spills out to external world, expressing kindness to every living creature out there. The next step is satya, which means truthfulness. And this step is also, there's actually two steps, ahimsa and satya, uh, were widely practiced by Gandhi. Being truthful, being truthful to yourself, to others, truthful to your values and living according to them. So when it comes to truthfulness, sometimes we think, well, if we're truthful all the time, you know, we may hurt ourselves, maybe in the short term at least, and so we choose to say white lies, sometimes thinking it's not that harmful. But in yoga, it is said that it is very important to be truthful in all circumstances, combined with ahimsa, combined with compassion. So when your truth is hurting someone, then it doesn't mean you have to lie. You just have to find another compassionate way to deliver your truth if needed. The third yama is um, brahmacharya, which means celibacy. Not very popular concept in the Western world in particular. It is also known as moderation um, in all things and things you eat, and things you wear, and things you do, and things you say. Then the next concept that we have, the next yama, is asteya. Asteya means non-stealing. And it goes beyond the physical objects that we can steal. Right? We can also steal uh, people's time, something that is not tangible, but nonetheless very valuable. Finally, the fifth yama is aparigraha, which means non-greediness, so non-hoarding of things. It's when you keep what you actually need and then not collecting so many things, be it physical or non-physical once again. So in positive terms, it could mean generosity, being generous with others, um, with things and your energy. So these were yamas, five yamas. Now we're moving on to niyamas, which means observances, things to do this time. And the first one is saucha, purity. Internal and external cleanliness. So keeping your body clean, keeping your surroundings clean, and when I'm talking about body, it's not just the outside, but also inside. It could mean eating healthy foods, clean foods, so to speak, and also keeping clean your energetic body. And that's when asana comes, which I will explore a little bit later. The second niyama is santosha, which means contentment. Also, I understand it as gratitude. So being content with what we were dealt with, the family we were born into, the body we were born into, and the circumstances that we find ourselves at this particular moment. Now contentment doesn't mean being satisfied and not doing anything, not moving forward in your life, but it means being grateful for what you have at this moment, and then using that energy, which you are not spending on complaining and on finding faults with everyone and everything, using that precious energy to move yourself toward the life that you would like to have, towards having the things that you would like to be manifested in your life. Third niyama is tapas. Tapas means austerity or discipline. 
This one I struggle a lot with personally, and I think some of you could relate to that. It, it's not when you don't have that self-discipline to wake up, let's say at 5 or 6 a.m. if you need to, or to practice yoga in the morning and meditate for 30 minutes or so. Um, so developing that discipline is critical in order to move through life in the most graceful way. It's igniting inner fire, using that energy to propel yourself again to the life that you would like to have. And then we have force niyama, force observance, which is svadhyaya. Svadhyaya is known as studying of sacred texts, but also it's known as a self-study. And I will talk about self-study here. So studying yourself, probably you've heard, know thyself. It's related to that concept. Very important to understand yourself, know yourself before we can effectively relate to the world outside. If you don't know your true values, you cannot live in alignment with them. So it is important to dedicate time to see what's happening in my mind. How do I react to certain circumstances, to people? And just observing uh, compassionately without judging yourself or labeling things needlessly. And once we uh, know ourselves better, then we can move towards the life that feels most natural to us. So this concept uh, can have a great impact if developed properly. Finally, the fifth niyama is Ishvara Pranidana, which means surrendering to God. Right. And if you're not comfortable with concept of God, you can substitute it with the universe, with the source, whatever word appeals to you the most. But basically, it means letting go and surrendering. There are things that are out of our control and actually more things are out of our control that are in. And that's why, again, releasing that energy to let go of things we can't control is so important in order to lead joyful lives. Ultimately, we're not beating our own hearts. We're not in charge even of our breath, even though we can control it in a way, which I will explain more in the next steps. Uh, so learning how and when to surrender is something yoga can teach us. So we're moving to the third limb, which most of you are familiar with asanas, postures, things we do in gyms, yoga studios, parks, everywhere. You see people go into different poses. And yes, definitely this third limb helps our body to be stronger, more flexible, have a better balance. Some people now recognize the benefits of better concentration and focus through the practice of physical postures. But it goes beyond that. So this step prepares us for meditation, for sitting in an upright position for a prolonged periods of time, which is necessary to our uh, seventh and eighth step. So doing postures not only strengthens your body, preparing it for meditation, but also helps us to clear energetic channels in our bodies called nadis. And according to yogic texts, we have 72,000 nadis in our bodies. And having them clear, the energy can flow freely and we can feel more alive and energized. So moving from asanas to the next step, fourth step, pranayama. Also more familiar than other steps to the Western world, prana means breath, life force, yama, extension or control. So pranayama is extending the breath, controlling the breath. Maybe controlling is not so much because again, ultimately we can't really control it. It's happening to us. But we play with the breath here and there are many different techniques and they have different purposes. Some of them can make us feel more energetic. Others calm us down. There are heating techniques, cooling techniques, and 
just having those tools can help us to access our nervous system more directly. So that's a very valuable step. So the fifth step, the fifth limb, is pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses, which is necessary for the journey that we begin to take, the journey inwards. If we leave our senses as they are, we can easily get distracted through our sight, our hearing, and there are plenty of distractions, especially in the world today. And so we learn how to withdraw the senses inwards. So we can focus without even necessarily closing our eyes. Even if there is an external noise, we can focus on the sounds within. And that is withdrawal of the senses. So we, uh, be we begin to draw in, inwards. The sixth limb is dharana. So now we're moving towards seated meditation, the beginning, the first step of the meditation. Dharana means concentration with effort. So it's focusing on a particular object and keeping your mind focused on it for a certain amount of time. And it could be anything. It could be your breath, it could be an actual physical object like a crystal, it could be the sound, or even your own visualization. You can visualize a flame in the third eye point. That would be practicing dharana. The seventh limb is dhyana. Dhyana is transition. It's a continuation of dharana. So if dharana was all about doing, actively focusing the mind on one point, then dhyana is about being. If you were, let's say, focusing on a sound, in dhyana, you merge with that sound. So there's no distinction between you as a separate being and the sound that you were focusing on. If you were focusing on, let's say, the object, an apple, you become an apple. So that is the next step of meditation. And finally, the last limb is called Samadhi. Samadhi is enlightenment. This is when we merge with the divine, when we transcend mind and body and we realize our divine nature. You can call it God realization, some do, but whatever we name it, it's when we have the knowledge that there is no separation. We realize that union. And if you remember from the beginning, yoga means union. So thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you will continue to explore this vast, fascinating subject, the tradition, art and science of yoga. Namaste.